Lori Power, Director of Faith Formation at Christ the Redeemer Parish, and welcome to Talking Saints. I'm here today with my co-host, Pete Sanchez, staff writer for the Catholic Star Herald, and we'll be spending about 15 minutes talking about a particular saint and how their example can inspire us. Because as Pope Francis reminds us, to be saints is not a privilege for the few, but a vocation for everyone. How are you doing today, Pete? Doing great. Lori, great to see you. We are recording this on the second day of spring. Yes. <laughs> so I am very happy that uh, we got the warmer weather here in uh, in New Jersey. Yes, so we made it through winter. <laughs> yes. And even though, even though the saints remind us to persevere in any and all types of storms and weather, and come what may, uh, I do believe, God forgive me if I say this time, the weather makes things a little bit easier. <laughs> I agree. The spring does. Spring does. Maybe that's why we celebrate Easter in the spring. Yes. <laughs> just because yes. it's new life and, and just, yeah, a little easier to uh, to celebrate, right? And before that, we're still in Lent. Um, yes. And uh, But you're making me think about Easter. It makes me think about Lent, which makes me think about our saint. Because mm. she endured the cross. I think it was St. Rosalima said something to the effect, uh, there is no other way to get what is it? The, there's the ladder is the only way to get to so Jesus. The, right. The cross is the only ladder to get to heaven. Thank you. Right? Thank mm-hmm. you. And this saint certainly had a cross to bear. She was a martyr. Yes. So we are talking about a lesser known saint. This is someone I just encountered uh, last year and was very inspired by her. Um, we are talking about St. Margaret Clitheroe, who has been called the Pearl of York. She, so she was actually an English martyr um, who died in 1586. Um, but let's back up and talk a little bit about her early life too, Pete. So she was born in York in 1556 and was raised a Protestant, which was the state religion at that time, because this was right after the time of Henry VIII and during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. So Catholics were, um, I would say, persona non grata in England. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> We're even worse than that, perhaps, at yeah. this time. Um, so she was Protestant initially. Um, then she married a fairly prosperous butcher, John Clitheroe, and a few years later actually converted to Catholicism after meeting the wife of a prominent Catholic doctor who was from York. And for us, converting to Catholicism, it doesn't seem too intimidating now. Um, There's probably a number of people coming into the church this Easter, right? But at that time, it was a pretty dangerous proposition because it was actually against the law. So when she converted, uh, she was just, she was a young wife and a homemaker, but she was also an outlaw because the state religion of the country at the time was to be a Protestant Christian. So she was putting herself in a little bit of danger uh, by embracing the Catholic Church. Yeah. And she did have, her brother was a priest, I believe, right? I'm not sure if it was her brother or her brother-in-law, but she definitely okay. had someone yeah. close so to she, her that was so Catholic, yeah. She could yeah, she could uh, uh, share that, and as well to hide the fact that she was Catholic, because that's what she had to do. It got very dangerous during this time. She actually had two different rooms, mm-hmm. one next to her house and another in another part of the city uh, where she where she kept priests hidden uh, and she had mass celebrated um, through all of this. So they would come to her house and celebrate mass for them. And uh, some of these priests were even martyred. Mm-hmm. And because of this, I think Margaret in some ways wanted the same thing. I think mm-hmm. maybe she had an idea that things weren't going to get any better. And uh, she did pray in front of the... Uh, I learned a new word today. Uh, in my research, it mentioned that she'd pray beneath the gibbet for this intention uh, of martyrdom, um, po- possible martyrdom. And the gibbet is actually the gallows where mm. well, you said, Lord, that Apparently, they were Yeah, the between 1582 and 1583, there were five priests that were hanged Gosh. there. So yeah. it was very, martyrdom was a clear possibility because it was happening right in front of her. So it wasn't like something she was just thinking, oh, that would be... Maybe, maybe I'll be a martyr, but she could actually see people dying for the faith in her presence. So she was actually arrested, um, imprisoned more than once. The first time was simply because she did not attend Protestant church services. So um, that was, there was actually a penalty set for that, a fine that had to be paid. And then eventually she was imprisoned for this. But while she was there, interestingly, um, 
she learned Latin so that she could pray the mass, which was beautiful. So she made good use of that time in prison. And it was a pretty, uh, it was pretty lengthy. I think it was almost a year, one of the times she was in prison. So she was suffering. This was, and she wasn't willing to um, give up her faith. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And what happened too is that she refused to plead because I guess the witnesses against her would be her children and she did not want to right. put scorn on them. So she was in prison the one time and then she was released and she was back in her home. And it was interesting that the, the um, practice of hiding priests was typically something that the upper class would do it's because they lived outside the city and they had the means and the space to, to support priests. So this is a much riskier um thing to do for Margaret because she lived in the city and she had neighbors all around her and she was always concerned that the neighbors would be spying on her. I think that's why, as you mentioned, she did have one room hidden in her own home, but then the other was elsewhere because she knew that her her neighbors would probably be watching her and mm -hmm. it would be hard to keep it a secret if she had priests coming in and out of her home. But unfortunately, her last arrest in 1586 was after her neighbors saw a man enter her home who they thought might be a priest and they actually called the authorities. And we have one of her her biographies um, describes what happened that day. So it was March 12th, 1586. While Margaret was busy with her household, two sheriffs of the city entered the Clitheroe house. Nothing suspicious was found at first, but upon opening the door to a remote room, the men found some children of the neighborhood being taught by a man that they sus suspected was a priest. In the confusion, um, the priest was able to escape through a secret room, but an 11-year-old boy who was living with the family at the time was interrogated so severely that he revealed the hiding place that was in uh, the Clitheroe home. No one was found there, but they did find vestments, a missile, and a chalice, everything that they would have needed for mass. So the sheriffs took these as evidence and then later... Uh, Margaret was arrested for harboring priests, which was a criminal offense punishable by death um, by the Act of Parliament of 1581. So at that time, she knew, it was a couple years later, that harboring priests could mean the death penalty for her, but she had such a great love for the Mass and for the Eucharist that she would continue to support them and hide them in her home. And uh, she, and sorry, jumped the gun a bit there <laughs> about okay. the, uh, but they did. So yeah, she, um, she refused to plead because she didn't want her children. Exactly. To... So the judges knew, I think that she probably could have gotten off if she had a trial because the evidence was weak. But as you said, she refused because she didn't want her own children or her servants to be in any way connected to her death. Yeah. So they even said to her, if you don't have a trial, we're going to have to condemn you to die by this awful means, be basically being pressed to death. That, mm -hmm. was the, that was the punishment in this case, the, the form of execution, which was pretty barbaric. Um, yet she said, no, I'm not going to, I don't want a trial and um, I'm not going to deny my faith right to the end so and she even pretty said, brave um she even said uh when she i guess she found out that she was about to die or by the way she was going to die she said god be thanked i'm not worthy of so good a death as this mm -hmm. and to make matters worse uh is believed that she was pregnant yes so that is incredible that they went ahead with this execution of this woman who was expecting her fourth child at the time. It's incredible. So the day of her execution came and she actually walked to the place of execution barefoot because she had sent her shoes to her daughter, Anne, sort of in token that maybe Anne would follow in her footsteps in the faith and possibly in martyrdom. But we'll talk about her children uh, later. So. Apparently, when she reached the place of her execution, she knelt down and she prayed for the Pope, the cardinals, all the clergy, the Christian princes in Europe at that time. And she prayed especially for Queen Elizabeth that God would turn her to the faith and save her soul. So she was definitely courageous right to the end. And they did try multiple times. They said, would you just recant? Just, you know, recant what you have said. And she said, no, no, Mr. Sheriff, I die for the love of my Lord Jesus. Pretty incredible, right to the end. And her last words were, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, um, and I think we don't know where her body is. That's right. But her right hand is preserved, 
in York at St. Mary's Convent. That's interesting, yeah. So, Apparently they have her hand, but we're not sure where what her final pl- resting place was. It's also interesting. So she was executed on March 25th, which is typically the date of the Annunciation. That yeah. year, however, it was Good Friday. So she really f- was following in Christ's footsteps um, so closely that they say she even died in a cruciform position. So they extended her hands and bound her hands um, in a cross position. Um, and then the, she was indeed pressed to death. So they laid a door and it, as some of the things I read said it might have possibly been the door from our own house on top of her and then put weights um, that totaled close to 800 pounds. And she was eventually crushed to death, which barbaric. Um, and she was only 29. And not only her, but her fourth child also died in this execution. So incredible witness to the faith. Um, I can't even imagine knowing that you're going to be facing a very slow and painful death. And she still um, went to it without fear, it seems. They said she was still um, positive and, and was, was calm as she was walked to the place of her execution. So she knew who she was dying for, I'd say, Pete. Yeah. She knew that her kingdom is not of this earth. Yes. <laughs> and um, and we want to talk about her children, too. Mm-hmm. She had a beautiful, um, I think two of her sons were priests. They became yes. priests. So she and, only had three children, right? And her two sons became priests. And then her daughter, Anne, became a nun. So uh, they all mean, kept to the faith. Interestingly, her husband never converted. But he uh, said of her that she was the greatest wife in all England and the best Catholic. So he still recognized her virtue and her goodness, um, even if he did not convert. And you have an interesting story. So why did did we pick St. Margaret? Oh, yes. Okay. So last year I encountered a new apostolate called the Seven Sisters Apostolate, which is basically a, a ministry of prayer for priests. And Margaret Clitheroe, because of her devotion to priests and to hiding priests and her devotion to the church and the Eucharist, is one of the patron saints of Seven Sisters. So I got to know a little bit more about her and I've been asking for her intercession as we pray for our priests. Um, And she just has an incredible story. So I thought it would be a good one to share during Lent and uh, during this season. Thanks, Lord. Thanks for uh, coming up with this. I never heard of her before. But it was nice to, uh, you know, hear her story and just heartbreaking. It is. And and can I, can I, do you think we should finish this maybe with this poem? Yes. Tell everyone about the poem. So and who this, wrote it? Pretty famous uh, poet yeah, this, decided uh, Father, to write about Margaret. Uh, Father Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote this prayer. And if you don't know who he is, I would, I would uh, look him up. He's a personal favorite poet of mine. Um. He it was an unfinished poem of his. So he he uh this one was titled Appropriately Enough Um Margaret Clitheroe. So I'm only gonna read excerpts of this, not the whole thing. Um but I just think it's beautiful. His words. Um She was a woman upright outright. Her will was bent at God. For that Word went, she should be crushed out flat. She held her hands too, like in prayer. They had them out and laid them wide, just like Jesus crucified. They brought their hundred weights to bear. Fawning, fawning crocodiles, days and days came round about, with tears to put her candle out. They wound their wench of wicked smiles to take her, while their tongues would go, God, lighten your heart, dark heart, but no, Christ lived in Margaret Clitheroe. When she felt the kill weights crush, she told his name times over three. I suffer this, she said, for thee. St. Margaret Clitheroe, pray for us. us. 